has been a time for gathering the longhouse and sharing information around the fire. This is our contribution to that tradition. So, uh, in a lot of ways, this is a video that I'm not really qualified to make. Uh, the topic is backcountry first aid kit, essentially. And, uh, you know, so I have a lot of um, field experience. I've carried a first aid kit. I've used it. I've gotten lots of first aid training over the years. Uh, but I thought it would be a really good idea to have uh, my friend Jeff Lawn from uh, School of Survival, who also just uh, uh, taught me... Uh, taught us the woofer class which is wilderness first responder of course I've been wanting to take forever um, and so Jeff is considerably more uh, knowledgeable and credentialed when it comes to this uh, Jeff you want to give us a little bit of your uh, uh, first aid background yeah for sure so I've been a uh, an EMT maybe for 18 years been a paramedic for the last seven years uh, I've done everything from uh, critical care stuff in the front country, busy urban 911 stuff, uh, to back country search and rescue, uh, expeditions, things like that. Yeah, so uh, in addition to teaching um, uh, first aid topics, wilderness first aid, uh, Jeff also teaches survival and outdoors related topics to essentially guides. Um, you know, so if you're a river guide, you might go to Jeff to, to learn not just survival, but uh, first aid and backcountry uh, first responder. Uh, so he's got a lot of relevant experience. So basically the format I'm going to take here is uh, I'm going to roll through my uh, first aid kit and we'll just talk through the items and uh, we'll have a little bit of discussion about some of them. Um, and as you can see, mine's in a red Hill People Gear tool roll. We do run these in red every now and then and of course for first aid kit that's a really nice setup um, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is something that's not actually in the first aid kit uh, and that is uh, a tourniquet now the thing about the tourniquet um, and I, I'll have uh, Jeff speak to this uh, what's really nice about Jeff's wilderness first responder course is that he starts with the uh, the March acronym, which he'll go into briefly in just a moment. But uh, and that's not a standard wilderness first responder thing. Uh, but uh, basically, tourniquets are for what I think of as extremely low likelihood but high consequence injuries. And so the question is: Is it worth? carrying some insurance for something that will absolutely kill you before anything happens is it worth carrying that uh, a cat t is three ounces plus whatever pouch you're carrying it in uh, the lightest way to carry it on a hill people gear thing is just under the bungees on your shoulder strap um, uh, but at any rate so for three ounces is the insurance worth it so jeff you want to talk about just quickly the march and yeah, so we use, uh, a lot of people have taken some first aid classes before. It used to be the ABCs, which start with airway, breathing, circulation, that adds some things to it. Um, we found over the years, looking at uh, retrospectively over trauma from uh, overseas and, and battlegrounds, things like that, that it's more important to stop bleeding than to deal with an airway. Uh, airways can take hours to deal with and you have to have a, a team of people and, and while you're playing with this airway trying to do your jaw thrust or, or as a medic trying to intubate or whatever it is, uh, this person is spurting blood out of there. There's no way that we can put oxygen back in their body through their respiratory system uh, that could compensate for how quickly they're losing oxygen and hemoglobin and the ability to carry that oxygen through a massive bleed. So M is massive hemorrhage. After we've done the scene size up and make sure the scene is safe, the very first thing we're gonna look for are these life-threatening massive hemorrhages. And the gold standard for that is a modern day tourniquet. Um, there's a lot of things uh, I've seen people talk about improvising with, with carabiners and things like that. It's good to have the mentality that if you have to improvise, you understand the concept of how a tourniquet works, but um, there is nothing out there that you're going to carry that's going to give you the ability to one-handed stop a life-threatening extremity bleed on yourself within 20 seconds. Um, Evan and I both carry our tourniquets on the bottom of our kit bags here. Um, you can grab this and apply it. You can self-apply this within, um, you know, within, within 20 seconds, probably one-handed. You can rip that out and take that out. Um, most people have never really dealt with a massive bleed. And you think about the biggest bleed, you've maybe you've, you've cut yourself or something like that and there's flowing bleeds. Um, 
when uh, when you see an injury like a chainsaw injury or a firearm injury where somebody has really really stuck a big pipe and huge amounts of blood is coming out of there um, your little piece of gauze isn't going to fix it your bandana is not going to fix it and playing with a few carabiners and trying to tension that it just is uh, just not appropriate the the best evidence based medicine the evidence that best suggests is to carry a tourniquet practice it and know how to use it. Uh, carry a real good tourniquet. There's a lot of cheap stuff out, out there that you can get the knockoffs. North American Rescue always sell the best ones. And uh, and you know again, so that, that massive hemorrhage, the first thing in that assessment is stopping that big bleed. And when it comes to uh, extremity stuff, the gold standard is getting a tourniquet on there for massive hemorrhage, right. arterial amputations. And so one uh, perception that people have is, oh, tourniquets are just for people in war or combat or something like that, or gun injuries. Um, which is, that's because that's where we learned about the efficacy of tourniquets and they became commonly used. But the reality, when you think about a backcountry, um, in addition to basically exposure and gut, you know, one of the biggest things that you potentially are faced with is uh, massive mechanical injury, right? You know, you slip on a mountain, a tree falls on you and don't laugh because once you've seen a tree come down in a forest, you get real serious about the likelihood of that and the danger of that. Um, you know, even uh, uh, an arm or something like that. When you're hiking in the backcountry, you actually are at reasonable risk for mechanical injury and the kind of mechanical injury that may need a tourniquet. So, you know, the tourniquet's up to you. A lot of backcountry people poo-poo them for three ounces. Is the in is ensuring that kind of accident worth it? That's up to you. I choose to carry one readily accessible. And a point there, it's not in my first aid kit because if I need it for myself. I'm not going to be able to get it out of my first aid kit quickly enough. Uh, so that's that's sort of the tourniquet uh, talk, and um, we'll go. Uh, I do carry another kind of tourniquet. I'll go to in a moment here, but uh, so from the top uh, in my first aid kit, I've just used a sharpie here to uh, actually um, lay out what each of the items are. So I've got a trauma section, um, and then I have a secondary um, pain meds and. Uh, uh, and uh, a little bit more trauma stuff. So I've got a couple things w worth of trauma. Uh, what I call boo-boos, that's the band-aids and stuff that most people think of going in a first aid kit. Uh, burn, uh, if you're playing with fires in the back country, uh, the burn stuff is definitely relevant. Um, I carry, there's a digestive section here which also includes uh, internal stuff, quick sugars, electrolytes. We'll go into that in a moment. Uh, and then I have an antihistamine section uh, which um, uh, we'll go into that. And then I have a section here for tools, deep cut, and then uh, controlled uh, controlled meds, which we will also talk briefly about. So that's how I've, at a high level, organized it. And uh, now we're going to break it down and go through what's in each of those things. Yeah. One thing to stress on here, there's a difference between your boo-boo kit and your life-threatening injury kit. Um, Evan was talking about this earlier. We get a lot of injuries that are low frequency, high acuity. And that's where the most danger is uh, for, for paramedics, whether it's something with, uh, <clears throat> with an injury or cardiac things or respiratory stuff. It doesn't happen very often. But when it happens, you have to be able to immediately do this, uh, do this skill. Uh, so <clears throat> the way that our, our human minds work is that... Uh, we think about things when I'm packing my kit. It's like, all right, uh, my my lips get dry all the time, so I have my chapstick right here, and I know exactly where that is. And if I need my chapstick, I can deploy that in 0 0.13 seconds. But I've never dealt with a life-threatening bleed in my entire life, so it's like, yeah, I got that stuff, and it's, I think it's back at the truck, or or maybe the buried at the bottom of the backpack, or whatever. Uh, we really need to invert that. Uh, if you want to carry a chapstick, that's totally fine. If you want to have it on hand, that's great. But uh, you have to understand that the the medical kit that you should carry should be set up so that life-threatening injuries, massive hemorrhage, airway, respiratory, circulation, hypo or hyperthermia, that's what you can take care of immediately. You've got that stuff on hand and you can get after it. And if your, uh, you know, if your Kleenex is back at the car, that's okay. You can blow your nose or something else. But the uh, the massive trauma stuff is the stuff that should be easily accessible and, and things you can grab quickly. And if, uh, you know, if you're if your uh, your boo boo stuff uh, is left somewhere, or you have to root through your backpack, uh, that's okay. So just make sure that you understand that kind of that mindset. Your life threatening injury kit should be quickly and easily accessible and set up in a logical fashion, so you can grab it and get to work and start taking care of these life threatening conditions.
All right, so the other trauma stuff that I carry, uh, I do carry the wound packing gauze, North American Rescue. Um, <clears throat> I carry a SWAT T tourniquet, I'll go into that in a moment, and of course the gloves that really we should wear if we're going to deploy any of this stuff. Uh, in addition to that, I have a clotting sponge, which I don't know, probably, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and so that's that's all of my like trauma supplies. Um, so. The thing about the SWAT T, uh, this is what it looks like. It's a long, stretchable rubber band. And you can actually, with a SWAT T, generate enough tension to uh, stop a bleed. Uh, the thing is that there are a whole lot of other things that you can get done with this SWAT T. That's a multi-purpose, uh, it weighs four ounces, so it's it's an expensive decision, uh, but uh, you can use it for uh, wrapping a sprain. It works fine for that. You can use it as a compression dressing. Uh, you can use it um, if you want to do a cervical uh, stabilization. You can use that in concert with uh, a SAM splint, uh, which also I carry in here. Um, so, and then the other thing is this is all great emergency fire starter. You cannot start this rubber with flint and steel, uh, but you can start it with a lighter and I could start fires for a year probably off of this, this amount of uh, rubber. So that's the SWAT T tourniquet and there is an argument to be made um, for potentially carrying just this. It doesn't have the efficacy and you probably are not going to get it deployed on yourself but if you're carrying it relatively accessible um, you uh, you can at least get it out and put it on somebody else and if you really don't want the weight of both uh, this this is more multi-purpose judgment call uh, so that's and this is how how small it goes SWAT T uh, the wound packing is for as Jeff was talking about um, packing those those uh, bleeds that are inside of the box the non-extremity bleeds uh, and then the clotting sponge has the hemostatic agent and I'm guessing that you would probably say hey uh, jettison the clotting sponge and get the the gauze that actually has the hemostatic agent on it. I don't know what you're calling that. Yeah, my uh, my recommendation, uh, so uh, so the hemostatic agent, there's a number, a number of them. Uh, quick clot is probably the most common. There's a lot of other ones. Uh, it started off as a powder, which had uh, some issues. And I think whatever generation they're on now, combat gauze is the stuff. So it's just like this. It's a vacuum sealed gauze. It expands to bigger than a roller gauze. And it's impregnated with that hemostatic agent on there. Um, so yeah, no, no wrong answer on that one. Uh, these clotting sponges work really, really well. Just understand that there's a, uh, a big difference between the stuff they might sell at your local outdoor shop that like uh, is like one four by four piece of gauze that's impregnated with quick clot versus a, uh, some gauze like this where the whole thing is impregnated with quick clot and the purpose is designed to like push it deep into those big cavities. But yeah, nothing wrong with that at all. Good stuff for sure. And these SWAT tees, um, you talk about multi-purpose stuff. The only, the group that uh, endorses like which tourniquets meet their standards uh, is the Committee for the Tactical Care of the Combat Casualty, C O T C C C. Uh, Dr. Andrew Fisher is one of the physicians that runs that. Brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, the only reason that the, um, that the SWAT tourniquet is not endorsed as a first-line tourniquet is because you can't self-apply it. Uh, so to meet their standards and be approved, you have to be able to one-handed apply it to any of your extremities. Um, if you really uh, are, are concerned about it and say, hey, I've never used a tourniquet in my entire life, uh, and you still can't be like, uh, like, like brought to the message about that, uh, get one of these. Uh, you can use this for, in our woofer class, uh, we used it for making splints and, uh, and stabilizing stuff and, and a dozen things making slings, dozens of things that you can use with uh, with something like this. So you can definitely stop big bleeds with this. Uh, and the uh, if you if I really can't talk and you're getting a tourniquet, which I, I really wish that I could, uh, you can grab one of these. They're super, super tiny. It fits anywhere. You can use them for a million things. Doesn't expire, doesn't go bad. And as Evan was saying, an emergency fire starter. Another big thing about these, uh, the, uh, the tactical medicine community has started to really embrace taking care of our four-legged buddies. And... Um, you cannot apply 
a modern day cat tourniquet to a canine. Uh, just the, the, the conical shape of their joints, it just doesn't allow it. So what they recommend for canines is the SWAT tourniquet. Uh, so I recommend ultimately carrying both. You want to have something you can stop that bleed immediately uh, and then have kind of a secondary adjunct if you need to. Uh, but these things, if you've got a four-legged buddy, especially like a big size, like a Labrador, some of the dogs running around here, um, put that in your, in your kit just so that you can know that you can use it for your, uh, your four-legged buddies. Right on. Uh, so mini Sharpie for uh, writing time and date and you know taking your notes on uh, uh, casualty care. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, so uh, the other thing that I picked up in Jeff's class that probably some of you folks know is um, the aspirin uh, for onset of a heart attack where you can delay some of the symptoms. And because I don't remember things, I've just put it in a little uh, plastic thing here and heart attack, 324 milligrams of aspirin, chew completely, dissolve in the mouth, and that's exactly the dosage that's there. So, you know, if somebody's having those heart attack symptoms, I've got a quick way of handling that. Yeah, that's a great way of packaging. We talk about uh, bringing some of these medications like aspirin and Benadryl and Motrin, and you go to the big box store and they've got huge bottles like that. And it's like, I'm not carrying 5,000 Motrin with me. That's like a, a lifetime supply. There's so many places that make these tiny little vials and you can put 20 pills in there. And it's like, all right, now now for, for the weight of carrying, you know, a fraction of that big bottle of Motrin, I've got some Motrin, I've got some uh, Benadryl and some aspirin. So definitely look into uh, what you can do to, to make it more, you know, you've got your truck kit that's got all that stuff in there and then you go backpacking and it's like, man, I'd rather have, I mean, these four aspirin uh, could save somebody's life that's having a heart attack in the back country. Absolutely. Uh, so I've also got um, some four by fours in here. Uh, this is just for the lighter wounds, uh, you know, the boo-boos essentially. Um, and then I have some of these really small hemostatic gauze squares. Again, that's really more for boo-boos, not for the big wound packing. Uh, then I have my meds, uh, ibuprofen, Advil, Tylenol, um, those sorts of things, all for pain management. Uh, Non-aspirin pain management, more ibuprofen there. Um, that's just pain management and that's pretty well understood. We know how to do that. Uh, so burn. Uh, working around campfires, um, burns are something that happen if you're not being careful. Uh, so I use these, um, and you know, these are all things that you can get at outdoor stores. Um, some of these things are carried by North American Rescue. Um, some of them are carried by the Nulls uh, National Outdoor Leadership School. Uh, they have a store, but this is just a burn gel, uh, water gel, and I have used this and it does work. And then I also have uh, a second skin moist burn pad here, which I've used and, and works on, you know, like a, a second degree burn. If it's third degree, you need to evacuate and figure that out. But, uh, you know, that medium burn class, these, these are relevant and keep you in the back country. That, that's a good point that he brings up is staying in the back country. Uh, burns, let's say a non-life threatening injury, really common one that you see is uh, you'll burn your fingers reaching into the fire. You grab a coffee cup or something like that that's really hot. You're not going to die from burning your fingers. Uh, you're not going to die from getting a little bit of boiling water spilled on you, absent infections, things like that. But it's going to be miserable, you know, and you burn your one hand right there where you hold your coffee cup and it's just a miserable experience. Who wants to be in the back country that lingering pain? Uh, so we can't do anything for you know, some, some massive like third degree diffuse burn, but uh, you can do something and say, hey man, this really, really sucks. I'm gonna put some on there, put some ointment on there, and now I can stay in the back country and I can participate in the sport for a little bit longer. So yeah, I totally yeah. dig it, good stuff. Uh, and then boo-boos, that's just a whole bunch of different sizes of band-aids and um, uh, antiseptic towelettes. And uh, so uh, here's an interesting point that I learned from Jeff. Um, so uh, this is the BZK, and you can probably tell me what BZK stands for, uh, but a lot of people, not a lot of people, there are people who are allergic to what I used to carry, which is the triple antibiotic ointment, uh, and so this, uh, what is it, benzo... Benzocolonium chloride. If I'm saying that improperly, I, I apologize. Uh, so at any rate, uh, I did find a source for these towelettes, and nobody's going to be allergic to this, and it is something that will, has efficacy against, um, you know, anything that... Uh, um, 
might contaminate that wound. Um, okay, so boo-boos, uh, burns. Uh, next we're on to the antihistamines, and Benadryl is what I carry for the antihistamines. I don't carry an EpiPen. Perhaps if I was a guide or a group leader, I would. Uh, but you know, for my personal use, uh, Benadryl, and um, there is actually a dosing guideline on the Benadryl, a maximum dosing that I really should have in here if I don't yet. Uh, but you know, there there are these allergic reactions in a lot of ways that you can get an allergic reaction. I also have some topical hydrocortisone cream, uh, but you know, if uh, uh, leaves of three, leave them be, poison ivy, the poison oaks, uh, any of those things are going to create a topical uh, issue, but I personally think that if you dose Benadryl orally, you can help stay ahead of like, like a systemic uh, antihistamine reaction uh, and then the other thing is uh, if I get stung by wasps I'm you know I'm not I'm not allergic to that so far as I know but again I'm gonna hit the Benadryl just prophylactically to stay ahead of any kind of systemic thing I'm in the back country I don't want it to go downhill and become a problem so I'm a big believer in carrying antihistamines for that purpose yeah and you look at something like this the weight on this is like grams and the cost is just nothing really uh, so bringing a few Benadryl same thing as the aspirin you don't have to bring a whole big bottle of Benadryl but bringing some back there uh, I promise you you might be in a situation where that could uh, somebody get stung by a bee and like gosh the last time this happened uh, I got really really sick and you can get some Benadryl going just like that and maybe help them with their EpiPen if it's indicated so yeah right good on. stuff uh, and then digestive and this is actually probably one of the more common classes of issues in the backcountry uh, is digestive issues so um, um, you know, I have the the uh, uh, suffer uh, reducing stomach acid. Um, you know, this is Prilosec, and I also tend to carry Zantac, uh, quick acting. Uh, but we also have things to uh, stop diarrhea, uh, and that's we had a great discussion in the class about whether or not you want to stop diarrhea if diarrhea is going on. But the bottom line is that. Um, at a certain point, fluid loss may be a bigger issue than whatever it is that's in, in your um, body. Uh, so you may need to stop that just to stop the fluid loss. And people tend to know their bodies, like how much of this they might take, but it's, uh, it's something that's worth carrying. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the gut issues. Uh, but also, uh, clumped under, under digestive, I have uh, both quick sugars and also... Um, uh, electrolyte drink mixes and the electrolytes I can um, talk to myself uh, I've had uh, hyponatremia twice in my life and it's the worst feeling in the world that's basically you're taking in too much water uh, and you're not balancing out with electrolytes and you flush your system of electrolytes it feels horrible um, and you know once was before I had any idea that was a thing back when I was fighting fire uh, the other time I was actually mountain biking out in the Moab area doing the whole enchilada and you know it was a hot day and we were you know it wasn't that big a deal I was drinking a bunch of water and and I suddenly got hyponatremia it's a bad bad feeling so if you don't have a good discipline of staying on top of electrolytes with your water you need to do that uh, but at the same time, if you get into a rescue uh, situation, I've got some that are dedicated to that. Uh, and then the quick sugars, um, it's better to ingest quick sugars in warm water, but if you get into a hypothermic situation, the quick sugars will uh, help prop you up. And also the um, fluid loss due to uh, massive bleeds. Didn't you also recommend quick sugars? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with, uh, with a lot of these things, you might be looking at them and saying, uh, you know, some, some flavored water stuff. Uh, we're not carrying this so that water tastes better so we can drink it. Uh, even stuff like this, electrolytes, sugar, that's life-saving stuff in the backcountry. Uh, you're back in the whole enchilada going through hazard County, and your muscles are cramping up because you don't have the right electrolytes. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that can sustain you and mean instead of having to hit the red button and get a search and rescue to come help you, you can say, all right, man, I, you know, I noticed you've been drinking a lot of water today and you still have these muscle cramps and you're at two gallons of water, you're not dehydrated. We've got a, uh, instead of the, the hydration solution, we've got an electrolyte problem here. And something like that, it's not just flavored water because it tastes good. Uh, it's the kind of thing that can really replenish these life-saving things. Pe people die from, uh, from hyponatremia from drinking too much water and not getting that replaced. And sugar, same thing. You know, sugar is uh, especially the short chain monosaccharides like glucose and fructose. Uh, your body has to use that all the time. 
the two things your brain has to have is glucose and oxygen. Uh, so if you're running out of that, especially if you have some sort of metabolic disease, diabetes, anything like that, uh, just having enough sugar to put in there and to kind of rekindle that fire, maybe hypothermia, uh, or somebody who has uh, diabetes and uh, they've taken too much insulin and not enough sugar, uh, they are uh, hypoglycemic. You can use some of this sugar to uh, to raise their blood glucose levels, and and that that's a life-threatening thing right there. People die from hypoglycemia for sure. Uh, and Jeff actually uh, brought up a point that I wanted to talk about and forgot. Uh, we both carry the Delorme Enreaches, and basically this is a satellite communicator uh, that basically allows resources to be mobilized. Uh, we recommend the Enreach because it runs off of the more robust satellite system. Uh, in some ways I don't like it because I, I think a lot of injuries happen in the backcountry because people have a modern mentality like, oh, phone calls just to help away so I can push push myself in ways that I shouldn't. Uh, I, I can do unsafe things and I know we see that behavior all the time. And it bothers me that I, I kind of feel like um, having this ability to call out anywhere that you are on the planet um, encourages that kind of thinking. Uh, but by the same token, things can simply happen that are not our faults. You know, you can't cheat the mountain. And if you spend there, spend enough time out there, um, no matter how careful you are, you do have the likelihood of something going sideways where you need extraction. And, you know, when I was a younger man, I would have said, well, if I die out there, that's fine. But, you know, I've got a wife and I got kids, I have responsibilities. Uh, so at least in this point in my life, I don't think it's appropriate, given the fact that the technology is available, I don't think it's appropriate uh, to run that risk and have that attitude I had when I was younger. All right, so uh, the very first thing I pulled out of here, this is the Sam Splint, uh, and it's actually the Sam Splint, I think they call it the Junior, whatever it is, it's half the size of uh, the biggest one. And the reason for that, the biggest one's four ounces, and to me it's just not worth it because there's so many ways to improvise. Uh, but, so after I figured that out, and this is actually one of the big ones just cut in half. Uh, after I figured that out, I, in the Whiffer course, I just started rolling with, it's the same size as the Junior, started rolling with this thing to see what the efficacy was. And it turned out for two ounces, I was able to get just about everything done I needed to with the Junior. And so I was like, okay, that's worth it for me to, uh, you know, what it is I need to carry. So uh, that's, and there's a ton of things that, uh, some of which are very backcountry um, relevant. You know, particularly a bad ankle sprain or something you need to stabilize. Uh, this is something that's going to get that done. So I do carry that now. So that brings us to tools, deep cut and controlled. Um, so shears are handy, um, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, also, uh, the uh, tweezers, huge, particularly in this part of the world. Uh, for uh, cactus spines, cactus thorns, but there's a whole lot of other reasons that you might need that. Uh, one of those things that's really hard to improvise in the back country is an irrigation syringe. You can poke a hole in um, a baggie and kind of get it done, but a nice irrigation syringe for irrigating those deep wounds, those knife cuts, uh, those sorts of things, even abrasions. Um, you know, definitely you go through Jeff's class, you're gonna spend a lot of time doing some good wound care and being able to irrigate uh, that's an easy way to get that done for no weight whatsoever. Uh, so uh, Vaseline, um, well, actually I'll talk about this first. Uh, this is uh, Dermabond, which is sort of controlled. Uh, there are some over-the-counter ways to get the same thing. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you use crazy glue to close a wound. Uh, no, you don't, because there's a chemical in it that's that's harmful. Uh, but Dermabond is essentially the medical version of the crazy glue trick. And um, I had always used something else, which I still do carry, and I'll go through that in a moment. Uh, but, you know, in Jeff's class, closing wounds on actual flesh, I don't want to ruin anything, but you'll get a chance to try that. And I was so impressed with this Dermabond uh, that I ended up, even though it's not cheap, getting that into my kit. Of course, you're going to have to irrigate and make sure that that wound is really properly clean before you close it. Uh, but, you know, this, I'm totally sold on this. And you can get Vet Bond online. It's exactly the same thing um, for, for pet use or animal use. You look at the ingredients, it's exactly the same thing. You can buy it over the counter. So that's a way to, to have some of that if you don't have a nurse for a wife, as I do. Um, and then Vaseline. Um, there, there's uh, 
quite a few things that Vaseline ends up being handy for, but it is the way to remove the dermabond, so it's important to have that as well, I think. Um, and, you know, I'll talk about the other um, wound closure kits that I have there. Boy, I took those out. I was so impressed with Dermabond. So the other thing is the old-fashioned Steri strips with, um, you know, Steri strips with the orange stuff, monkey blow. What is that? Uh, uh, the adhesive. Oh, um, tincture of benzoin. Right, right. To to basically help those things adhere. And there is a trick to using the Steri strips. So I used to carry kits that was Steri strips with the tincture of benzoin with Tegaderm to seal the whole site. And I've used those. Um, at home, not necessarily in the field, and they work great, but uh, uh, after I discovered this, um, the the Dermabond, man, I, I don't see any reason to carry those other kits. I don't know, would you say there's any reason to carry the Steri strips if you've got this? Not really. Uh, a lot of the medical kits that you see out there, uh, I won't say anything because I'm not going to call anybody out here, but a lot of these medical kits, um, they're designed to be sold rather than to be used by professionals. And you look at this kit and it comes in a cool little bag mm -hmm. and it essentially it is like uh, 250 different sizes of band-aids and it just doesn't have any, doesn't make sense to me. What I'd recommend carrying would be carrying some gauze and some tape and you can make band-aids with that. You can make stereo strips with the micro pore tape uh, and you can also stop life threatening bleeds with gauze. 200 band-aids is not going to stop any kind of big bleeding, you know? Uh, so um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's what I've, a um, little bit of mole skin, I've never used it myself, uh, but, and actually I'll get to that in a moment, but uh, uh, some mole skin's good. Um, and then I have some controlled meds, if you have some better painkiller, if you have uh, the ability to get um, perhaps um, antibiotics, that's on you. You can talk to your doctor about that, get that prescribed. You tell them, you know, hey, I spend time in the back country. Um, it would be handy for me to have prescription and a lot of doctors are understanding and will prescribe you what you need to be able to, to do that. Um, and then the other thing that I carry, uh, this is a silk bandana, one of the cowboy bandanas. Uh, it's obviously not uh, sterile, but you know, it's, it's washed and put into a Ziploc bag so it's clean. This is a huge uh, bandana. Uh, this is something I can use for dressing. It's something I can use for um, uh, wraps of ankles and wrists, uh, supporting stuff in much the same way as I could use the um, the SWAT T. Uh, and because it's orange, I could use it for signaling. Let's say a chopper needs to set down and I need to get a flag in the air so they can see uh, wind direction on the ground. Uh, this is big enough that it'll actually do some good if I tie it somewhere they can see it. So that's a multi-purpose item that doesn't weigh much and you know I've carried one of those for a long time and, and I feel good about that. So that's um, really the conclusion of what I carry in my first aid kit but what might be very interesting is the discussion we're about to have. Uh, so, uh, so now what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, identify the items that I have personally used on a solo backpacking trip. I have a mentality of being very cautious. Um, I don't set daily distance goals because that gets you in trouble. Uh, and you know, I've talked about that on other videos, but uh, basically I travel the backcountry as if I'm a guy 200 years ago who was completely on his own. And so uh, this is what I've used personally. Uh, I got out of the tent in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and it was super cold. It was, I, you know, less than 10 degrees down in one of these desert canyons in the middle of winter, and uh, I was really tired, and I walked into a patch of prickly pear, and so in the middle of the night, I had a use for these. And that, other than... I do use ibuprofen, but not on an emergency basis. I have it. I've had a long day. Uh, so some of those meds, but that's really all I've ever used. So if you go from, you know, past experience, that's the only thing I need when I'm by myself. Uh, past experience with groups, different story. With groups, I've used burn gel. I've used mole skin, uh, and I've used... Uh, deep wound closure kits to include the irrigation syringe and I've used um, uh, band-aids of course and I've used burn gel. You go out with a group and 
it's crazy. I'll go years and years without using this stuff. I go with a group, all my band-aids are gone. I've used a couple burn gels and like my moleskin's all gone. So, you know, what realistically should you carry? There's a lot of discretion there. Like this, this whole kit, that weighs a pound and a half. And as a backpacker, a pound and a half is expensive. And so, you know, is this worth carrying backpacking? I don't know. I'm actually probably in the process of coming up with a pared down backpacking kit, which is something I always used to have. And that's something I got to spend some time thinking about. Tell you what, hiking, front country, going out with groups, it's not going to step down from this one bit because I feel like with this, I'm pretty doggone prepared. Um, and, you know, honestly, if I was a guide where I was going out with groups all the time, I might be beefed up even beyond this. I don't know, what do you have to say about all that? Yeah, very good points there. Uh, I think Evan was talking about uh, kind of a technique we use in backpacking and where uh, maybe after every backpacking trip you look at stuff and say, you know what, I got this super cool tarp because in the store it was awesome and the guys on the internet really like it, but I never used this tarp one time, you know, and then you can start saying, all right, so now after four trips I haven't used this and it's a two pound tarp, I'm just gonna leave that at the truck next time. Um, the thing about medical stuff is that uh, when you really, really need it, you'll go years without needing it. And then when you need it, uh, that's it's like a fire extinguisher. When you need a fire extinguisher, you need a fire extinguisher. Nothing's going to take its place. And what you need is that fire extinguisher. What you need is diphenhydramine. What you need is a tourniquet. Um, so uh, we've been, uh, you see them all the time in a lot of the internet discussions and a lot of the people that are into ultra ultralight stuff. Uh, and... Um, I'm kind of, I, I'm not really into ultralight at all. I just carry what I want. I just, I, I'll just, just carry it, suck, suck it up and uh, put, the, put the calories into it. But I'll tell you, when people talk about weight and they say, I'm not going to carry a tourniquet because it weighs too much. Um, I'm a bigger guy myself, so I'm not trying to judge anybody here. If you don't have the physique of an endurance runner and you want to save three ounces, go rack out some push-ups. Prove to me that you want to save those three ounces. Drop 15 pounds of body weight and then say, all right, I'm really concerned with like, you know, th this way six grams more than I can bring, so I just won't take care of these bleeds. Uh, if you're really concerned with, um, with weight of some of these things, uh, like I said, unless you look like an endurance runner, you could probably, the, the best way to lose some of that would be some of the, uh, the excess survival muscle that you have, and then uh, just bring this stuff with you. Um, Things that happen in the backcountry happen very, very quickly, kind of zero to 101 second. And you all get to the campsite and you're having a good time and, and, and you're, you're getting ready to make cheeseburgers or whatever and somebody slips with an ax and, uh, and hits a big artery and some tendons, maybe a bone, and the biggest bleed you've ever seen in the entire world. And you look up and you realize that like, there's no 911, uh, you've got to stabilize that patient. And I promise when that happens, you're not gonna be saying, man, I'm glad I saved uh, four ounces by not grabbing one of those tourniquets. Um, so you just have to have the discipline to say that some of this stuff I may never, ever, ever use, but if I need it one time, then it's gonna save a life. Um, and then some of the stuff, you know, like a chest seal, being able to use something like this or something like this or that baggie to seal a chest, uh, an open chest wound, just look around the next time you go camping and you could say, all right, maybe, maybe I could make a tourniquet with this. Okay, maybe. Uh, maybe you could use some sticks to stabilize an injury. Um, you're not going to find anything out here that's going to seal a chest, uh, an open chest wound. There's nothing, you know, a mullen leaf or whatever, just not going to do it. Uh, so. The, uh, what I would recommend is, is knowing that you have to have what we call our march kit, your primary assessment stuff, uh, and carry that kit on there and just discipline yourself to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suck it up, I'm going to carry the weight, uh, whatever it is, I'm going to make sure that I have this kit with me if some of these things happen. Uh, I think this kit looks really, really good. Uh, we went through his kit in the, in the woofer class some. Um, I like that he carries it at the top of the pack so you can grab everything quickly. Um, good meds in here. Um, yeah, like he was saying, some of the stuff like uh, irrigating uh, a wound, you know, our ultimate philosophy here is wilderness philosophy, or wilderness uh, first responders, is that I don't want to have to leave the wilderness. And if I can stay in the back country and, uh, and, and you know, close an injury, make sure it's not going to get infected, provide that definitive care and stay back here, then that's what my goal is. Um, if your goal is different from that, if you're just uh, hiking around the neighborhood uh, in your, uh, you know, your, uh, your area where you can call 911 and have an ambulance 
there in five minutes. Maybe it's a little bit different. Maybe you do want to say, hey, I want, I want to get this uh, evaluated by a physician. But so many injuries that you get back here that maybe you could put sutures in in the front country or whatever. Um, being able to clean them and definitively seal them, uh, I think that's our goal in, in staying and playing as long as you can. If possible, there's no life threats. Right. And I guess the thing I'd add, um, I have a really good track record because of my mindset. Uh, but you spend enough time in the outdoors and you're going to see things that are going to make you realize that no matter how good your mindset is, there are a lot of random circumstances that potentially could could result in an injury no matter how careful you're being. So, you know, all this is up to you. I've run through what I carry, why I carry it, uh, with a lot of help from Jeff. Um, I will say uh, Jeff has his own uh, YouTube channel. I recommend checking that out, School of Survival, and uh, I'll link to it here. Um, for you know a lot more medical information but uh, uh, this is something you really should consider and uh, you know here's here's how I've set it up and other people are going to set it up differently and of course the the training context is huge right you need to have the skills to go with these things and I'd recommend you take a class from somebody who's who's teaching either wilderness first aid or wilderness first responder um, and then of course a good stop the bleed cast uh, class um, you know Jeff teaches one Carrie Davis of Dark Angel Medical is another great resource for that good stop the bleed, bleed class for front and back country um, so uh, I think that covers it. I appreciate you uh, standing in for all of this, and uh, be safe out there. Yeah, be safe out there, guys. Cheers.